In this tutorial, we'll take a look at uh, independent and dependent events. And we're going to start with uh, a what's called a tree diagram. So this tree diagram is a way to graphically represent something that uh, uh, usually a compound event, not a single event, that's happening. And in it, we're going to simulate uh, rolling a normal six-sided die and then tossing a coin. So since uh, when you roll the dice, there's six possible outcomes, that's why there's six branches here, because there's six possible outcomes when you roll a normal six-sided die. So this represents the beginning, and then this is the first event, like the rolling of the die. And the um, second, so we'll write uh, those possible outcomes, one, two, three, four, five, six. And you write them right on the branches. Now, the second event, it's a tossing of a coin. And when you toss a coin, there's two possible outcomes. You can get a head or a tail. And so from each of these branches, we'll have two come out. So two, because there's two possible outcomes when you toss a coin. And so put an H and a T on each one of those, like that. And so if we st start here, if you got a one on the rolling of the die and then a head on the coin, then that's the outcome that comes along from along that branch. So that means getting a one in the coin, a one in the die, and a head in the coin. Uh, the next one would be a one on the die and then a tail. Right down to the bottom, you see right here, this would be getting a six on the die and then a tail. And then we can fill out all the other ones as well. So this is uh, right here. This is actually called the sample space because it's a listing of all possible outcomes. You can get everything from a one and a head to a six and a tail and everything in between. That lists every possibility. Now, tree diagrams can also be drawn up and down as well instead of across the page. So this represents the same thing. So here's that's, that's the start here. And then there's six branches here to represent the fact that you can get six uh, different rolls, one through six on the die. And then a head or tail on each coin. And there's all the outcomes for the sample space. So you can draw it uh, oriented that way as well. Now, sometimes one event has an effect on a subsequent event. And we'll talk about that more near the end of the tutorial. Uh, for example, if you draw a card out of a deck and don't replace it, so this is called sampling without replacement, if you don't replace it before drawing a second card, then the chance of getting any particular second card has changed. So these events would be called dependent events. So for example, let's say you uh, the, you were interested in the probability of drawing a queen from a normal uh, deck of cards. So there's four of them there out of 52 cards. So on the first draw, you'd have a 4 in 52 chance of getting a queen. So let's say you actually drew a queen. Well, actually, it, actually, it doesn't matter. You don't have to draw a queen. You draw any card. The, let's say we're interested in the second for the second draw of getting the probability of a jack. Now, of course, if you um, if you did get a jack, then there would only be three left. But if you got any other card, the um, on the second draw, you, there's four jacks left, and there's but there's only 51 cards now because we already took one out. So the um, the chance on the second draw of getting a jack has changed slightly because of the fact that you're not putting the card back in that you drew first. So those are called dependent events. If you're drawing cards out and you're putting them back in each time, then the probabilities don't change. But uh, if you're not replacing the card each time, then the next the, the probability of the next event has been influenced and changed slightly. So independent events occur when one has no effect on the other. For example, if you toss a coin, you roll a die, it really doesn't matter what you get on one of them, it doesn't change what you get in the other. So if you get a head tail on the coin, the outcome of the die is completely unrelated. So for example, in the coin, the probability of getting a head is one in two. Uh, the probability of, let's say, getting a five on the die is still one in six. So it doesn't matter what happened here, this is still one in six. So in this example here, this is uh, the tossing of three coins. Uh, the tosses would all be independent. It doesn't matter what happens on in the first toss. The second is unrelated, and so is the third. So now in this tree diagram, I'm not going to put any probabilities in these. We'll get into that later in later examples, because these are all equally likely. This would be a half, a half, a half, a half, a half for every single one. So the 
And so when they're all equally likely, uh, they're probably getting three heads in a row. So this is the three heads in a row. The only way you can get three heads in a row. And if you count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, there's eight possible events in the sample space. So the probability of getting uh, three heads in a row would be one chance in eight. Now, uh, I, I said I'm not going to write the probabilities on here, but if we did, these would all be a half. So this would be a half, this would be a half, this would be a half each time of getting a head. So notice that if we multiply the half by the half by the half, that actually is equal to one eighth. So you can actually use those probabilities instead of saying, well, it's one chance in eight here. Now they're probably getting two tails. Well, there's three different ways you can get two tails. You can get a head first and then two tails. You get a head, sorry, a tail, and then a head, and another tail. There's a second tail, and you get two tails in a row, and then the the third one's uh, third rolls a, a head. So the probability of getting two tails would be one, two, three chances in eight. Now notice that each of these would be a half times a half times a half for its probability, and there are three of them. So you could actually multiply the half by the half by the half and multiply by three because there are three of them. That will also give you exactly three eighths. On to uh, page number three here, the uh, multiplicative uh, uh, principle for independent events. We'll talk about dependent events on the next page. Uh, example number two, a spinner is as shown where the yellow is half the area, the blue is a quarter, and the red and the green are each one eighth of the area. And we're also going to throw a weighted coin that has the probability of uh, heads occurring as a two and three chance, and of course then the tail would be one and three. And we're going to draw a tree diagram to represent this experiment. So uh, we're talking about you doing the spinner first and the coin second, but we could have done it the other way around. It wouldn't matter. So the uh, the spinners first, though there's four different colors. That's why there's four branches coming out here. And of course, we'll put it's yellow, blue, uh, green, and red. And then we're throwing a uh, this weighted coin, so it could be head or tail. Let's put all the H's and T's. And then we'll list our whole sample space. So this would be uh, a yellow on the spinner and then getting a head in the coin. Yellow on the spinner getting a tail. Along here, uh, blue on the spinner getting a head, etc. So that's the whole sample space. Now, these probabilities, unlike the previous example, aren't all a half. They're not all equally likely. So, for example, the yellow is half the area. So the probability of getting a yellow is 1 in 2. The probability of getting a blue is one in four, and then these are both one eighth of the area, so these would both be both one eighths. One eighth. Now we're told that the coin isn't a fair coin; it's a weighted coin. So the probability of getting a head is two thirds. So probably getting a tail would be one third. And of course, uh, same with all these: two thirds, one third for all the head and tail branches. So in uh, in B here, I have to find a couple of probabilities. The probability of a yellow and a head. So the probability of a yellow and a head is just this outcome. There's no no other ones that have both a yellow and a head. So the probability of getting a yellow and a head. So what we would do to get to that point, we would multiply the probabilities along the branches. So one half times two thirds. And so uh, one half times two thirds, one times two is two on top, two times three is six on the bottom. And we can divide those both by two and we get one third. Now, so notice that if we don't have the same probabilities in all the branches, then even though it's one outcome, it's not one chance in eight like it was in the previous. So for B here, we're asked to find the probability of either a red or green and a tail. So that would be those two, a green and a tail or a red and a tail. So let's uh, calculate the green and a tail first. To get to that point, we would uh, the probability of a green is one chance in eight, the probability of a tail is one chance in three, so one eighth times one third would be uh, one over 24. One times one is one, eight times three is 24 in, in the denominator. And for the uh, red and a tail, so it's one eighth times one third, which is also, of course, one over 24. So the probability of getting a red in the tail or a green in the tail, we would add those two probabilities because there's two ways of getting a successor, either a red or green and a tail. And so 1 24th and 1 24th adds a 2 24th. Of course, you can divide both those by 2 and get 1 chance in 12. 
So this is how you calculate when uh, uh, the events are independent. We're going to talk about dependent on the uh, last example here. So we have a container that has three red chips and two black chips, and a chip is drawn and not replaced. So it's like the queen taking the queen example from two pages ago, taking a card out, and you don't replace it before you take a second. So a chip is drawn and not replaced, and then a second chip is drawn. So we're going to actually we're going to create a tree diagram to model this. So uh, there's only two different colors. There's five different chips but it's either red or black. So that's why okay, at the beginning you can either get a red or a black. So, so this would be getting a red and this would be getting a black. And then of course uh, after you draw each one you could still get another red or black each time. So here's the sample space. Red, 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 black, black, red, or black, black. Now, the probabilities. In the beginning uh, three of the five chips are red. So you get a three in five chance of getting a red. You would have a two in five chance of getting a black because only two of the five chips are black. Now, at this point right here, you've taken a red one out. So there's only two red ones left to get here out of four. So you've already taken one out, so there's only four chips left. So this is two chances in four, which reduces to a half. The uh, black, like if you've already taken a red out, then this is down to two, and then uh, two of the four chips that are left would be black, so this would be a half as well. Now down here, uh, we've already taken a black out, so there's only one black left. There'd be, uh, like at this point right here, there'd be three red and one black left, so there's still four, but uh, the chance of getting a red would be three chances in four. Because um, if we uh, if we've taken a black out, there's still three red left. So three chances in four of getting a red, and of course if we've taken a black out, uh, there's only one black left out of the four. So there'd be a one chance in four of getting a second black in a row. So we're asked to find uh, these probabilities. So the probability of getting two red chips. So this one here. So we will go three fifths times one half. Now. The one half, see these events are are dependent. The, see the this prob the second probability has changed because of the fact that we um, we're not replacing the chip each time. Uh, if we're replacing the chip each time, then this would be three fifths. This would be three fifths. The probability of red every time would be three fifths if we were replacing the chip. So this one half is uh, the probability of getting the second red one uh, is conditional. I'm going to talk about this formula down here at the bottom after we finish these two examples. So we're going to multiply 3 fifths by 1 half. 3 times 1 is 3. 5 times 2 is 10. So it's 3 chances in 10. Uh, the probability of a red chip and a black chip. So red and the black. It doesn't say in any particular order. So we would go red and black plus the probability will get a black and a red. We have to add the two together. So the red and the black. So we would go 3 fifths times 1 half. And the probability of a black and a red, the black and a red would be two fifths times three quarters. So each of these are going to multiply to three tenths. Three times one is three, five times two is ten. Uh, two times three is actually six, and five times four is twenty. But six over twenty reduces to three tenths again. And we add three tenths and three tenths, so we get six tenths, which reduces to three fifths. Now, a little bit about this formula down here. This vertical line here stands for uh, given uh, something that's happened previously. So uh, in order to find the probability of A and B, it's the probability of A happening uh, on the first draw or whatever the um, experiment is, multiplied by, and so this is the name of the second probability. It's the probability of what you're looking for happening given that A occurred. So this is the this is how the formula changes the conditional part here because you see this one half is a slightly different probability than the first one because of the fact that we were doing things without replacement. So the name of that probability is the probability of B given that A occurred. Notice that that event is the same thing as here. So that second probability that's the formula looks a little different because of the fact that it's dependent because you're uh, we have two events that have some relationship between one another. 
So the way we read this again is the probability of A and B occurring is the probability of A times the probability of B given that A occurred. So uh, that's how the formula looks different because of the fact that they are dependent events. And that's the end of the tutorial.